Hi everyone, welcome to this lecture on ethics and the Bible. This is being offered in conjunction with my summer 2022 Bible study cover to cover, where we look at the entire Bible in about 16 weeks. And in the course of that class, often there's a lot of questions about ethics, about some of the issues confronting modern day society, and how do we wrestle with those? How do we determine the will of God when the Bible is an incredibly ancient document that does not reference some of the concerns of our day? They don't even really have context for it. So what do we do about those? And then some of the concerns of our day do have mention in the Bible. And so again, just in general, how do we wrestle with ethical decisions in the church? So let's dive in. So just some of the concerns in Western culture, there's more than these, but these are sort of the biggies and certainly the ones I get asked about a lot in class. Um, the first sort of category is human sexuality. And in this, we ask about sexual relationships and gender roles, which is something sort of relatively new. Um, not just gender roles, but expressions of gender. And that's really become a, a hot button topic in modern day times. And um, then we have marriage, which I've called out separately from human sexuality um, because the verses that we're gonna look at are a little different. Um, we wanna know what the theological definition of marriage is, how that ties into God and how we know and understand God. Um, in under marriage, we also wanna look at divorce and singleness, singleness being a definite affirmed pathway of discipleship in the Bible and something that we don't necessarily highlight within the church. Um, next category could be called human life. This encompasses things like abortion, capital punishment, assisted suicide, or this idea of the right to die, where if you have a terminal illness, um, you can you know, choose to end your life. Um, war, you might have heard of something called the just war theory. And so we ask as Christians, is war ever justified? And social justice, which includes things like critical race theory and racial injustice, economic systems and injustice, and modern day slavery like sex trafficking, amongst others. There's more than even this. I won't be able to talk about all of these today. I'm going to look at a few of the issues and we'll get into that more in a minute. So ethics in the Christian faith. As believers, we have to engage in critical and reflective conversation about ethics. We can't shy away from it and be afraid that, you know, if we talk about these things, we're going to turn people away or make people feel excluded. That's not the idea. Um, the idea is to welcome everyone into Christian community, but we must contend with these issues. We must talk about it. We must wrestle with it in community and figure out what the way forward is. How does God call us to live? Um, as believers, we are called to submit to the authority of scripture and stand together on its foundation. This is important and this is fundamental to understanding this entire conversation. The ethical decisions we make as believers are not going to be the same as the rest of society. And they're not going to make sense if you don't submit to the authority of scripture and the lordship of Jesus Christ, I would add into that. Um, both assertions must be made to then understand the reasoning for our ethical decisions. And together we try to determine the will of God for our community of faith, for fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't do this exercise for the outside world. So we have to recognize that we cannot expect the rest of society to conform to the way of life embodied in the church. We cannot coerce or force moral consensus. Much of our convictions, again, as I said, only make sense in light of our faith and in light of our understanding as the Bible, as, a, you know, an authority in the way that we are to live. So what are some difficulties in wrestling with modern day ethics? Well, when it comes to the Bible, the difficulty isn't necessarily in asserting the fundamental truths of scripture or that it should be foundational to the way we live. 
But as anyone who's done a Bible study knows, there are diverse interpretations. There's diverse methods of interpreting the Bible, and this yields all sorts of different readings of the biblical text, some better than others, but there can be multiple readings that fall within the lines of orthodoxy, but that do differ from one another. And so the question becomes, how do we discern a way forward when we're wrestling with interpreting the text to begin with. And then we think about society. Uh, as I said earlier, society's definition and pursuit of ethics is going to conflict with our worldview. And so we ask, how do we follow the Bible? How do we stand on these biblical principles and yet also live in the world and serve the world as the hands and feet of Christ? Um, it's a tight, a tight little rope that we walk uh, between these two. And especially important to consider, especially if you live in the Western world or, you know, I'm thinking of the United States here, which is where I'm from. We have grown up, or at least our country was founded in part on biblical principles, Christian Judeo values. Now, there's a lot of debate on how well we've followed those values, but we can attest that our documents contain references to God. Um, references to biblical values. And because of that, for some time in our country, the Christian worldview and the worldview of the United States were somewhat aligned, not perfectly, but more aligned than they are now. And in recent years, in the last couple of decades, we've seen a divergence where now the Christian way of life is not the norm of modern day society, not the norm of the United States. It's something different. It's become countercultural, which, by the way, is what it was always intended to be. And because of that, some of us are wrestling for the first time with this idea that our ethical determinations are not necessarily going to reflect the rest of society. And again, that, that creates tension. We live in the world and we're supposed to. We're called to go and be in the world and to make disciples. And so we've got to have one set of principles for ourselves, but understand that the rest of the world isn't necessarily going to adhere to those principles. So uh, Richard B. Hayes says this, the most powerful argument for the truth of scripture is a community of people who exemplify the love and power of the God they have come to know. So uh, being a person of faith, attesting to the Bible as fundamental is not just about head knowledge, but it's about the way that we live as well. So we are going to be closely following Richard B. Hayes' book, Moral Vision of the New Testament. And in it, he identifies some frameworks and some um, methods to use as we tackle each ethical issue. And I really appreciate his way of approaching this. I think it is sound. And so I am going to follow his model and, and heavily rely on what the work that he has already done. But I will say that this book is actually a little out of date at this point. He wrote it, I think, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and now we're in 2022. So there's some issues, especially concerning human sexuality and gender, for instance, that he doesn't address in his book because they weren't really on his radar at the time. Um, so I'll talk more about those at the end of this. So he identifies a framework to help us see clarity as we're looking at this biblical text and encountering multiple um, potentially correct readings of this. How do we sort of bring this all in line? Is there some way of looking at this that we can use as we're making ethical determinations? And so he says, he identifies that, yes, there is. So we need to read scripture faithfully in a disciplined manner so that the Bible shapes the life of our church. Note, we don't do this as individual autonomous units. This is meant to be done in community. And that is in itself a difficulty because with community comes differences. And so we seek unity and we seek consensus on these issues. And so sometimes this takes time and it means wrestling, and it means living and doing life alongside of people who don't necessarily agree with us on some of these issues. But nevertheless, we are to do this in community. So he's identified some steps. Uh, first, we read the Bible carefully. This is where Bible study is important. This is where I recommend 
doing a Bible study of the entirety of Scripture, something like cover to cover, which I teach. Um, there's Bible in 90 Days. There's Disciple Bible Studies in the, in the United Methodist denomination. Find something that leads you through the entirety of Scripture so that you have a good foundation and understanding for how it all ties together. Next, we seek unifying themes within Scripture or images or just something that helps us connect very disparate voices. There are, you know, 40 something authors of the Old Testament. There's 66 books in the Bible. It ranges over a huge time span. Um, this is a library of information, not just one continual story by one author. And so we've got to seek points of unification, points of consensus. Then the next step, once we do this, is to relate the Bible to our situation. Because as Hayes says, it's not enough to understand scripture. We then have to allow it to transform us. It, it should be this new way of life that we live. And so to do so, we have to engage in what he describes as metaphor making. Because the Bible is some of it you know, thousands of years removed from our time. Some of the issues that we deal with, they didn't even have context for. And so we'll find sometimes an issue has a lot of biblical witness or verses that talk to the issue, and sometimes there's nothing. And so we've got to place our concerns, our 2022 concerns, within this world of the Bible. And sometimes, often, that in involves using metaphors like, okay, this is how they might not have had the same issue, but this is how they wrestled with this idea. And how can we then extrapolate that and lay that over the issue that we're dealing with? And then the next step is to live out the text. He writes that there's no true understanding apart from lived obedience. We live out scripture in the life of our Christian community. We make the word of God a visible reality to people who aren't believers yet in the way that we live our lives. And so it's not enough just to read it. We've got to also have evidence of the transformation that comes from having a relationship with Jesus. So biblical framework for ethics. Hayes identifies three images that can unite the varied voices of the New Testament. And these are community, cross and new creation. So when we do encounter biblical texts that speak to an ethical issue, we then take these three images and overlay those and say, okay, well, how do we understand this in light of community? How do we understand this in light of the cross? How do we understand this in light of new creation? It just helps us kind of hone in on what we're after. So community means that the church is a counter-cultural community of discipleship. This is important. And for some of us, this is a new thing. For others, depending on where you live and the culture you were raised in, you've always known that the church is counter-cultural. Um, we are not to seek um, unity with the outside world. We're to seek unity among ourselves as believers. And often our way of life is going to be drastically different from the rest of society. We are also a community that embraces discipleship. This means that we um, follow Jesus Christ. We profess him as Lord. He is the way, the truth, and the life that we follow. And we seek to emulate him and his teachings. We become the disciples of Jesus and we together in community work our way forward in faith. And the primary sphere of moral concern within the community of the church is not about the individual, but it's about corporate obedience. Our first question should be, what should we do as a community rather than what should I do as an individual? This is different and hard to wrap our minds around, especially if you come from Western culture, um, especially in the United States. We value independence, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and getting out there and going after what you want. And the biblical framework says, no, we need to be concerned about community and we need to collectively work together to follow the will of God. The next image he identifies is the cross. This this should make sense to us as Christians. 
this is a clear, easy one. Um, Jesus' death on the cross is the paradigm for what it means to be faithful and obedient. And we, as the community of Jesus, express and experience the kingdom of God by participating in Christ's sufferings. Um, this means we pick up our crosses, we follow the feet of Jesus, and we are willing to lay down our lives for the sake of following Christ. We are willing to give up anything that God asks um, all of it is count. We count as nothing in in comparison to our relationship with God. And the final image he Hayes identified is new creation. So our community embodies the power of the resurrection amidst a world that hasn't yet been fully and completely redeemed. So we talk about this as the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God. Jesus has ushered in the kingdom of God. He has taught us about this kingdom. And as believers, we have the deposit of the Holy Spirit living within us. So we have the power now to make this kingdom visible to the rest of the world. That is our job. But it's not a complete reality, and it won't be until Jesus returns again. There's still brokenness in the world. There's still sin. Evil is still at work. Um, we still contend with suffering. There are hardships that we confront as human beings, whether or not we assent to Jesus Christ as Lord. And um, that won't be fully put to rest until Jesus comes. Then evil will be conquered once and for all. Sin will be no more. There will be no more mourning or sadness or darkness. All of those things will be removed from the picture once Jesus Christ returns. So in the meantime, we as the church embody this strange temporal sensibility. We have this capacity for joy amidst suffering, which is counterintuitive. And yet we recognize that things aren't as they should be. And so there's impatience there. So we find joy in our suffering. And yet also we recognize that this isn't the way it's supposed to be. And so we are impatient for the return of Christ when all things will be set right. Um, once we kind of look at the text itself, at the Bible, and we look at it through these lenses through the cross, through community, through new creation. The next thing we want to look at is other sources of inspiration. Um, so scripture was first, and then we look to tradition, church tradition, reason, which is our intellectual capacity, and our experiences. We say that scripture cannot be interpreted in a vacuum. The task of interpret interpreting the Bible always involves looking at church tradition, what has been said down through the years about this topic, um, con consulting our own reason and intellect and science and discoveries and, you know, psychology and all of these types of things, um, human intellect that add to our understanding. And then finally, our experiences. Um, following Jesus is about relationship. We have a relationship with God. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. So we experience God sometimes in special ways, and that can heighten our understanding of what the Word of God is saying. All of these four things are sometimes referred to as the Wesleyan quadrilateral, but a better image is the one that you see on your screen if you are watching. If you're not watching, think of a stool where scripture is the seat of the stool and then the three legs supporting the seat are tradition, reason, and experience. So scripture is primary. It is the foundational guidance, way of life, um, foundational truth for believers of Jesus Christ. But scripture can be enhanced. Our understanding can be supported by church tradition, our ability to reason, and our experiences. They are Those three are equal to each other, and none of them are meant to replace scripture. We can't say, I've had this experience, and I believe it cancels out what scripture is saying about a topic. Or I you know, found this scientific research, and so I'm going to do away with what scripture said. Or church tradition is saying this, so I'm going to give that prominence over scripture. Scripture is the final word on an issue. But our tradition, reason, and experience often helps us interpret or see scripture maybe in a fresh way. 
Now, the way in which these have been wrestled with over the years have changed throughout the history of the church. In the Reformation, they were really focused in on church tradition and how does that relate with scripture. And um, the Reformation was all about throwing off traditions that seemed to be count, you know, that contradicted the word of God. Then came the Enlightenment. This is the age of reason and science. And so the question became, how does those things, how does reason relate to scripture? And then finally, in our modern day time, it is all about experience. This is how we have arrived as a society to this idea that it's all about your personal truth, your personal journey. What do you want out of life? What brings you joy and satisfaction? Go pursue that. And there's just less of this communal idea. And more than that, our society says, we have to validate every single person's experience and we have to be accepting of it. And if we aren't, then we are hateful, we are outdated, we are terrible people if we don't validate and accept every single experience. But that is a huge problem because experiences are different and there's no consensus among experience often. And so it becomes this mishmash where everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes and there's no fundamental truth. There's nothing external that society is looking for to offer guidance. That is very problematic. And within the church, some people in the church are attempting to elevate experience over scripture and say that because I've had this experience, it negates what scripture is saying. Also problematic. Um, so be aware of that in your mind as you're looking at these issues that experience, in many cases, people are having that wipe out what scripture says and that that is not correct. Old Testament, New Testament. So when we talk about ethical concerns, we're mostly looking to the New Testament, but this doesn't mean we discount the Old Testament entirely. Um, if you've studied the Bible in full, you know that the New Testament is very much based upon the writings and teachings of the Old Testament. Um, sexual morality in the New Testament draws upon what is sometimes very explicitly stated in the Old Testament. Um, in the New Testament, we are encouraged to care for the poor. Economic inequality is a huge concern in the New Testament. And this comes from a foundation laid out in the Old Testament where it was also a concern. Um, when the New Testament sort of goes beyond the Old Testament, reveals something new or expounds upon the laws and teachings of the Old Testament, often this is explicitly stated as Jesus does in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. He says, you know, you have read, do not murder, but I tell you, and then he goes on to describe hatred and um, anger and saying and doing things in anger as a form of murder in and of itself. So if we follow Hayes' framework of community, cross, and new creation, we find that these two have some grounding in the Old Testament. Um, there was community in the Old Testament. It was the covenant community of Israel. Now in the New Testament, we've got the covenant community of the cross, of the church, of the people who follow Jesus Christ. Um, the cross itself, this is definitely a new thing in the New Testament, but it does draw upon the Old Testament ideas of sacrifice and hum humility and obedience that was experienced by following God's law. And the new creation um, in the, draws from the Old Testament imagery of God as creator and redeemer of Israel and this idea of the new Jerusalem built upon what Jerusalem was always intended to be. But we also recognize that Jesus' death, resurrection, and enthronement are the central action of God. These, this is the pinnacle of the story of us, of the Bible, of God's plan of redemption for the whole world. And so the New Testament has special privilege, especially when we look at ethics. The New Testament is the lens through which we look back on the Old Testament and sometimes offer correction or enhancement or nuance to what we've learned there. And so when we're looking at ethics, we're mostly going to look at New Testament passage, passages, but every once in a while we'll pull in something from the Old Testament as well. So modes of ethical discourse in the Bible. 
Hayes has rightly identified that not every um, phrase in the Bible or verse is meant to be interpreted in the same way. Uh, if you've taken Bible study with me, you know I talk a lot about genre. If we look at Psalms, that is the genre of poetry. We are not going to interpret a poem the same way that we're going to interpret a law like in Leviticus. Those are straightforward. They are what we call rules. Uh, whereas poetry is more symbolic in nature. And so we have to do some more metaphor making when it comes to poetry. So he's identified four modes that help us as we're wrestling with ethical decisions. So the first mode is the mode of rule. This is pretty straightforward and easy to identify. These are direct commandments or prohibitions of specific behaviors. An example, thou shall not kill. Principles are more general in nature. It's kind of a framework by which a decision or action should be governed. And so an example from there is Mark 12. I'll identify some more examples of principles as we look at some of these ethical topics. Then we have paradigms. Um, these are stories or accounts of people who model for us exemplary context conduct or sometimes bad conduct as well. So an example would be the parable of the Good Samaritan. Through this story, Jesus teaches us the model of a, a good neighbor and what it means to love one another. Then we have symbolic world. Um, these are categories through which we interpret reality. So, you know, symbol, symbols that help us understand how we are to be as the disciples of Jesus. So an example of this is in Romans, Paul's discourse on human sinfulness, and we'll look at that more in depth when we get into some of the specifics. So where do we start? Um, Richard Hayes says, our lives ought to change in response to the gospel, a gospel that unsettles what we know about responsibility and ethics. So before you even begin, a good exercise is to say, what do I at this moment believe about a certain issue? What have I heard from the outside world? What is it, you know, what preconceived ideas am I bringing into this? And then we want to identify them so the best we can, we can set them to the side and say, I am going to approach this task with eyes wide open, ready to receive the direction from scripture, open to whatever it is that God is going to say to me through his word. We want to set aside some of those biases or preconceived ideas that might make it difficult for us to really see what God is trying to say. Um, the church is a living metaphor for the power of God to which the Bible also bears witness. So we ourselves become a metaphor. We demonstrate to the rest of the world what the kingdom of God looks like. So there's great responsibility in that. We're not just reading the Bible and closing it and saying, well, that was wonderful. And I feel great about what's being said in there and go about our lives. The Bible should also transform us through um, following Jesus Christ. We should reflect what the kingdom of God looks like. So the Bible shapes us we embody its meaning, and thus we receive fresh readings as we grow in spiritual maturity, as we confront different situations in the community of faith. We can go back and have even better interpretations than we've had before if we're doing it the right way, um, if we're elevating scripture to its proper place, if we're professing Jesus as Lord, and if we're relying on prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit, um, we can come to even greater understandings and interpretations of scripture. Right readings of the Bible by necessity must result in embodying the word. We must be transformed by the word through the power of the Holy Spirit. If we aren't, we need to go back and read the Bible again. And then once this, you know, we're involved in the community of the church, we're reading the Bible, we're allowing it to transform us, then we start to talk about these issues. And we do so with humility. We maintain relationship with God and one another. And we engage in prayer at all times, tapping into the power of the Holy Spirit. And we seek unity. 
Ooh, that seems like a lot, doesn't it? Quite a challenge, but it is possible. It is possible if we um, stand firm on the word and look to the spirit to help us in this endeavor. So Richard Hayes writes, anyone who joins a community of faith should know that it is a place of transformation, of discipline, of learning, and not merely a place to be comforted or indulged. Let me pause there because that is such an important statement. Um, it is very countercultural. Right now, the rest of the world, our society, wants to be comforted and wants to be indulged. Um, they want to hear that whatever they choose, it's right, it's good. We affirm you and you go do you. And that is not at all what the Bible teaches us. And that is not at all what we should be finding within the community of faith. We should find authentic people who are wrestling with these issues, who are allowing God to transform them by humbling themselves and who are pursuing lives of discipline, discipline, self-sacrifice. These are the kinds of things we're going to encounter in the community of faith. So the community demands that its members pursue holiness, while it also sustains the challenging process of character formation that is necessary for Jesus' disciples. The church must be a community whose life together provides true friendship, emotional support, and spiritual formation who every, for everyone who comes within its circle of fellowship. Everyone is invited into the community of faith. Our doors should be open to anyone and everyone, period, without qualification, just as God extends love and grace to every single person, period, full stop. But within this community, we don't just indulge our human desires. We don't just comfort each other and say, oh, everything you're doing is fine because God just wants you to be happy. No. Within our community of faith, we recognize that we are being called to holiness. We are being called to become disciples of Jesus Christ, which means we're going to go through this process of transformation. And we recognize that we are going to be called to live lives of discipline. Um, there are going to be things that we are asked to give up as disciples of Jesus. And Jesus lays that out for us pretty clearly in scripture. So I cannot stress that. Read this and read it again, because this is what our churches should, should look like. Not places of just full sale acceptance of whatever life you want to live, but a place where we accept all people and then together we encourage each other to become Jesus' disciples and with all that that entails, including discipline and self-sacrifice. So the process of discerning then what that looks like on a practical level, talking about the issues of the day, how do we decide what to do? Well, first and foremost, we have to recognize that there's no single overarching answer that addresses all ethical concerns. There's no formula I can give you or anyone can give you to say, just apply this to your issue and you will have the answer. Each thing has to be wrestled with on a case by case basis. And any ethic that intends to be biblical must understand that not all ethical concerns have equal weight within scripture. There are some issues which are seen to be fundamental and central to the New Testament. And there are some things that, although still important, are not fundamental. They're more peripheral issues. And so a proper look at ethics is also going to say, okay, we're talking about human sexuality. Where does that fall? Is it a central thing in the New Testament? Is it on almost every single page? Or is this something that, though still important, is more peripheral to a, a greater concern? Um, for instance, economic ethics, economic um, injustice and writing that injustice is central to the witness of the New Testament and by the way of the Old Testament as well. Um, I would say that that takes central preeminence over something like human sexuality that though still important and still something that we have to contend with as we are disciples of Jesus, it is a more peripheral issue than, let's say, economic injustice. But we can look at that in more detail. 
Um, so we will address each topic following this outline that Richard Hayes has given to us. Um, praying always, always as we engage in these things. Identifying biblical texts that relate to the issue at hand and the modes in which they're operating. So saying, if I'm talking about divorce, which biblical texts can I identify in the New Testament that talk about divorce? What mode are they operating in? Is this a rule? Is this a principle, a paradigm, or a symbolic world? Then we're going to look at those texts through this framework that Hayes has identified. Community, cross, and new creation. How can those lenses offer us clarity into what these texts are saying? Then we look at other things. Tradition. What has church tradition said about divorce over the years? What, is church, what does our reason teach us? Are there scientific studies on the effects of divorce? Are the you know, effects of staying in a bad marriage? Um, then we look at experience. What do Christians who have experienced divorce have to say? Where have they found God in either staying together in their marriage or going through a divorce? And we take all of this and come up with conclusions and implications. And we do this with gentleness, with humility, in the community of faith, not as individuals, but wrestling with these things together and always recognizing that we are human beings. We are limited in our ability to have perspective, especially in the midst of our own time. We can't see the big picture often, and that only happens through a retrospective glance back. So we want to consider this all with humility and with gentleness and with patience and with the power of the Holy Spirit at work. So I'm going to take us through three of the many ethical concerns that we are talking about these days. Um, some of you have sent in things that you want me to discuss. You'll, some of you will find that answer today. Some of these things I won't get into. Because I realize this is such a huge and important subject, I am going to teach a Bible study in the spring semester. So sometime in late January, early February of 2023, I'm going to teach a Bible study on the New Testament and ethics. And we'll take a topic each week. We'll look at the biblical texts. We'll follow this kind of framework that Hayes has identified and I really agree with. And we will do even a deeper dive than we're going to be able to do today. This is trying to be high level and even this is going to be long. It's just not something that can be taught easily or in one hour. Um, so please keep your eye out for that. I look forward to that study. I think it's going to be awesome. Um, my only prerequisite for that study, I'm just going to tell you now, is that you have taken um, a whole Bible Bible study, whether that be my cover to cover or a class called Bible in 90 Days, which you can find at many churches. There's disciple Bible studies, which you'd find in the United Methodist denomination, just something that leads you through all of scripture. I want you to have that foundation before we dive into these ethical issues. So today we're just going to talk about three. Um, I'm trying to choose uh, one that has quite a bit of biblical texts, one that has some biblical text, but not that much, and one that has almost nothing. And how do we wrestle with each of these types? And then we'll, again, deal with all the rest of the issues or as much as we can in the Bible study in the spring. So the first topic I want to look at is divorce. And I'm not going to go through these biblical texts. Um, so I'll have you look these up on your own because for the sake of time. So I'm going to condense what they say here. So each of these texts function in the rule rule mode, which is interesting. So clear cut do's and don'ts with regard to divorce. But there's also some other modes that they function in. So Mark 10 and Matthew 19 say, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And First Corinthians says it is to peace that God has called us. These are principles. And we can interpret this as functioning as a principle as well. So not necessarily a hard and fast rule, but a principle. God has joined us together. Let no one separate. Maybe we should think twice about divorce. Mark 10 also functions in the mode of symbolic world. So here we understand that God constituted a normative reality by making 
us male and female and then by joining the male and female together as one flesh this becomes the foundation for understanding what biblical marriage is why god created marriage and what its purpose is and so this gives us a reason for the rules that govern divorce kind of a background for understanding those rules each of these affirm marriage as a permanently binding commitment between one man and one woman in which the two become one. All discussion of divorce must then be understood only as matter as a matter of tragic and exceptional qualification to this vision of marriage. So now we turn to Hayes's frameworks, these images that unify the New Testament. So considering divorce in light of community, we recognize that it is not merely a private issue, which is counterintuitive and countercultural. Um, we want to make divorce about just the two people who are engaging in that divorce. But the Bible teaches us that everything is about the biblical community. Um, what happens to one person or to one couple concerns the health and wholeness of the entire faith community. Divorce is an issue of discipleship. Um, we are that living metaphor. So not just what we say, but what we do reflects or should reflect what the kingdom of God looks like. And so nothing that we do is private when we are part of God's kingdom, when we are part of a community of believers. Um, the cross, so marriage, is affirmed throughout scripture as difficult and often costly. We see this in the Old Testament. Um, I think of the story of the prophet Hosea who had to marry the prostitute Gomer and the difficulties that they experienced in their marriage, which God specifically called Hosea to engage in. Um, the Bible calls believers to a reversal of the world's structures of power, and this includes within the within marriage. So in the first century world of the New Testament, um, especially in the Jewish communities, the husband had all the power. He was the one who could decide to divorce. Um, there was debate about what were good reasons for divorce, but he was able to issue a certificate of divorce or, you know, divorce his wife. And he had all the power in the relationship. But in the New Testament, they're going to call believers to recognize that in Christ, we have unity. There is no more um, hierarchy between men and women in Christ. There is now equality. It is the kingdom of God as it was intended to be, which was equality. In the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, they were equals, different, but equals. And this is what we get back to through the through faith in Jesus, by living out a life in Christ, we experience a reimagining of the relationship between men and women. And the disconnect is healed. And now there's equality. And so in the Roman world, in the first century world, husbands still had power. So the Bible calls husbands to give up that power, to give up their prerogatives, to be willing to lay down their lives for their wives, um, to give all of that up, just as Jesus gave up some of his divinity to come and live a human life. Now, both husbands and wives are called to sacrificial self-surrender, but the role of the husband is specifically highlighted because there was so much inequality between men and women in that day. In our time, that's lessened somewhat. So now we would more highlight the fact that it should be mutual submission to one another, willing sacrifice. Um, the husband lays down his desires for the sake of the wife, and the wife does the same for her husband. And if this is being lived out properly, and each is truly giving up oneself for the other, this should work out to be a healthy marriage. Then we look at new creation. Through faithfulness to the one flesh union, Jesus' disciples embody what new creation looks like, manifesting what creation was meant to be from the beginning. Again, wholeness and unity and self-sacrifice and loving the other more than the self. Um, that's what creation, the new creation is going to look like. There won't be divorce when Jesus returns again. But, dot, 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 the writers of the NT New Testament realize that until the kingdom of God arrives in its fullness, 
human messiness will necessitate pastoral solutions. We don't live in the fully realized kingdom of God yet. So unfortunately, there will be times when divorce happens. And so we need to, as a church, wrestle with that and figure out when is, when is that going to be permissible for us. The next things we look at are those extra biblical sources, tradition, reason, and experience, and how do these enhance our understanding of what scripture is saying. So tradition is quite a mixed bag. Um, some denominations are more lenient when it comes to divorce. The whole of Protestant Reformation um, speaks to this issue, and then others are not as not as lenient. Um, so it's hard, you know, it depends on what denomination you're looking at when you look at this issue. Overall, church tradition has tended to expand what, you know, the exceptions to the rule against divorce. And in some cases, this is a good thing. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. When we look at reason, um, we look at scientific studies, psychological studies on the effects of divorce versus the effects of the damage that can be caused by terrible marriages. And again, we get mixed results, a mixed interpretation coming from this. Um, some people can point to divorce being, um, although tragic, something that brought health and wholeness to their families. Um, and some people point to divorce as, you know, really causing them great heartache and strife for the rest of their lives. Next, we turn to experience. We have to be careful here because experience has led some denominations to go beyond allowing exceptions to divorce to in some ways seeming to affirm divorce or make divorce a celebration. Um, some denominations now have liturgical services to mark the end of a marriage and in these services they affirm this new covenant of divorce and that's taking things too far. While we need to recognize that there, you know, we live in a broken world, um, the fullness of Jesus of God's kingdom has not been realized yet. Uh, we don't have to go in the other extreme of affirming and celebrating this as something that we should just allow wholesale. Uh, we must teach that love is an act of the will, that marriage mirrors the costly fidelity of Christ to the church and that the power of God can transform us and redeem situations that look hopeless. No marriage is beyond the power of the Holy Spirit to redeem and restore um, when appropriate. And again, we'll get to the things that, that do call for um, a permission of divorce. So what are our conclusions and implications from all of this analysis? Marriage is an aspect of discipleship. It's a reflection of God's unbreakable faithfulness. So marriage is a covenant before God between one man and one woman. Divorce is contrary to God's will, although it's permissible in extraordinary circumstances. So in the New Testament, they specify sexual infidelity and the desire of an unbelieving spouse to separate as reasons to permit a divorce. But through church tradition, we have also added abuse as a reason for divorce, be it physical, mental, or emotional abuse. Abuse is terrible, it is damaging, and it creates an unsafe situation for the abused spouse and any other family living with the couple, whether it's children or extended family. And in these situations, the safety of the spouse and children and other family members is paramount. And so it is absolutely in a reason to allow a divorce. Um, marriage, we need to teach kind of proactively what marriage is and what it isn't. Because if we just let society have the last word about marriage and divorce, our the generations coming after us are going to be led astray in this regard. And often that's what we're doing. And many times the church is silent or doesn't talk a lot about these issues because there's concern, you know, the pastor doesn't want to cause pain, um, recognizing that the statistics point to 50% of marriages ending in divorce. There's debate about how much that's reflected in the church. But anyway, recognizing that in our congregations, we have divorced persons that often pastors themselves have experienced divorce. Um, it's 
it's painful and no pastor wants to rub dirt in the wound and say divorce was wrong when you might be saying I know it was wrong but it, I had no other choice or I felt like you know that was the best option for me but we can still talk about marriage and divorce and what it should be um, and extend grace to the people that have unfortunately had to experience it for themselves. We cannot shy away from these subjects because we're worried about hurting someone's feelings. We can be gentle, we can be loving, we can extend grace in these conversations, but the conversations must be had. Otherwise, we're letting society have the only word, and that is never good because society teaches all the wrong things about marriage. It teaches that marriage is about gratifying yourself. It is about personal growth. It's about what you can get out of it. And if you stop getting something out of your marriage, then you should just leave it and move on to the next thing. That is not what the Bible teaches. So we need to be preemptive and proactive in teaching right relationship and what marriage is. We should be going to our youth ministries and talking about marriage what what it is, what it isn't, what we look for in a spouse, what we don't look for in a spouse. So marriage is not about feelings of love. It is about the practice of love. Marriage is not contingent upon self-gratification or personal fulfillment. Sometimes, though, we must recognize that, yes, one partner deeply wrongs another, and the marriage cannot continue despite best efforts. If this happens, the church should love and support both persons. Divorced persons should be fully received into church community and extended the grace and mercy that we all require. Uh, we are all broken. We are all sinners, the Bible tells us. We are all need in need of God's grace. And even once we become believers and attest that Jesus is Lord, there are still things that each of us wrestle with. And so, you know, we cannot call out one group of people over another. So we still receive divorced persons. We receive them with love and grace. But as I said, we don't shy away from also teaching that um, divorce is not right. We don't want divorces. We want marriages that are covenantal marriages that last. So remarriage after divorce should not be excluded as a possibility. Um, when we do the Bible study, we will look at this because there are some New Testament texts that discourage remarrying after divorce and some that leave the door open. And so we'll look at those more closely and we'll try to, you know, consider the tension between them. But as the church, church tradition, as we apply reason and experience, here's an area where those can help us understand that we've got to consider grace and redemption, that God brings grace to bear. God can redeem anything, any kind of sin and brokenness. And sometimes that redemption is found in a second chance, in a healthy covenantal second marriage. And uh, we have to to leave that door possibility open. The community of the church must, and I think this is so, so, so important, we must find ways to affirm singleness. We must find ways to enhance community for single persons. We must find ways to emphasize that singleness is absolutely a wonderful path of discipleship. Marriage is not the be-all and end-all of human existence. It is not the only way to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Singleness is another way. Um, and we affirm singleness for divorced persons, for widows and widowers, and for those people who have never been married. We need to find um, a way to provide deep and satisfying community and friendships to this population. We need to shatter the myth that only married people are normal or that only marriage offers human fulfillment. Singleness is absolutely an authentic vo vocation as stated in scripture. And there are benefits to singleness that we don't experience in a marriage covenant. There's benefits to a marriage covenant that single people can't experience. Um, there's blessings for both paths of discipleship. And, and we tend to focus on marriage and not so much singleness. So a couple quotes for you. Um, it could be that in time, marriage seen as a sacrament and lived as if it were a mystery of grace will become nearly as radical a choice as monasticism, a countercultural thing. Maybe it is already 
understood properly. I think that's such a good quote. Marriage, biblical marriage, understood in the implications of our theology and the covenant union that we make with our spouse and with God is absolutely countercultural to what marriage is defined as. Um, and we need to be living into that truth and teaching that truth. The next quote says, In making the covenant of marriage, you form a union that reflects the love of God and stands as a sign of God's love in the world. Marriage is a sacrament in the true sense. It is both sign and vehicle of grace. Now, not all denominations cause, call marriage a sacrament, but I really believe that it is one. Um, a sacrament is defined as a sign and means of grace, and marriage is that. It shows us what the relationship between God and God's people is, that God chooses to love us even on the days when we are not living in the will of God.